Well, good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. good morning. There we go. We had to wake everyone up this morning. I want to encourage those of you who are out in the lobby, start to make your way into to this room with us. And I want to invite you to stand. And we're going to sing some praises this morning. Would you join me? sing this together and I search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along Put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all. And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley And there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Turn graves into gardens. 
You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. And there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. got a model before others that we just, we just don't want to look right, we want to be right. Faithfulness is an expression of wholehearted devotion. The, the mess in our country today, we have sold our souls to images, projecting an image. Culture trivializes grandparenting. We need to separate what was cultural, what was Christian culture, from what was scripture. And this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. And this is the word that our grandchildren need. They need the word of God. They need to be convinced of the authority and sufficiency of the Bible. You want this generation that you can impact to take God seriously. I want to leave a legacy of integrity. Not look how good I was, but look how good he is. I love that we can be reflectors back to the generations behind us of the goodness of God. It's not the Sunday school teacher. It's not the youth pastor or the youth worker that's number two. It's not the Christian school teacher. My friends, I wanna tell you, you are an ideal discipler for your grandchildren. They need to hear truth from you. They need to hear it from you. We can have an influence in this country. We can make a difference. We will elevate it, and we will fulfill godly Christian grandparents. We can do it. Good morning. Making you say good morning more than once this morning. My name is Sue Backer, and today is Grandparents' Day. Woo! Did any of you know that? We have a super excited fella in the front there. How many are, are grandparents? Raise your hands big and high, and I want you all to look around and see who all are grandparents. I mean, there are a lot of grandparents out there. Well, happy Grandparents' Day to you. As the video said, we have something very special coming up, and it is Legacy Coalition's Grand Parenting Summit, and we are a simulcast site. We are one of a hundred um, simulcast sites, so we're very excited about that, and as you can see, we'll have some great speakers and a lot of resources to support and help you as a grandparent. How many of you, um, want to spend eternity with your grandchildren. The Bible tells us that we have a responsibility and a call to action to help share our faith with our grandchildren. And that's what the grandparenting ministry is all about, is to um, support and give you resources to help you do just that. So we have a table in the back. Uh, in the foyer, come by and see us. We've got some free gifts for you grandparents that help in that journey. And we also can help you get signed up for the summit. We really would like to see you come and take um, part in that summit. So, Now, if you are a first-time attender, we would like you to text 
welcome to the number there, 308-252-3273. Let us know that you're here. Somebody will reach out to you. If you have a prayer request, text prayer to the same number. And I know that our leadership, our pastors and elders pray every week for those prayer requests. So will you stand with me, please? If you're close to a grandparent, will you just put your hand on their shoulder? And let's bless our grandparents today. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for these grandparents. We thank you for the blessing that our generation enjoys of long life so that we can know and be a part of our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren's lives. I pray for each grandparent here that you'll deepen our faith in you and our relationship with our families and that you'll bless us with opportunities to use the gifts and talents that you've given us to share our faith stories with the next generation. Bless us with the power of your spirit to overcome barriers that get in the way of sharing our faith as well. And Father, now I ask that you bless all of us here as we enter into worship together, may our faith in you be strengthened and our relationship with you and with each other grow deeper and stronger. In Jesus' name, and everyone says, amen. Let the whole world see. We're 
singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the Let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Jesus, shining light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Sing that out together Shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Your breath 
all the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. When our hearts cry out, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Father, you are great, and your name is worthy to be praised. So Father, help us to do that, not just when we're here in this building, not just when we're watching online, but Father, every single minute of every single day, let us pour out our hearts and our lives as an offering to you. Father, speak to us this morning, speak through John as he um, introduces us to the book of Judges this morning. We're so thankful for your presence in this place. In your name I pray, amen. Like if you've read it, and that's why I'm saying, like you should read it, and, and maybe you'll have your own, maybe it won't be Jack Wagon, maybe it'll be something like, maybe whatever nice version of that word is that you say. Like these people are just, are just crazy. Like when you read the story, you can't figure out what's going on. And maybe when you see that graphic, you know, is that gratuitous? Boy, that's a lot of blood. There's a lot going on here. Why are, why are we doing it? Like, have you read the book? Especially when you get to the last four chapters of the book. It is, it's a whirlwind of chaos, death, and destruction. Of a, of a culture and a society that is supposed to be godly, completely off the rails. It's what happens when, when people do whatever they want, which is, one of the themes of the book that's going to come up toward about midway that starts to show up. Like when people do whatever they want, we have chaos, death, and destruction. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the kind of where the, where the book fits in the Bible for a minute. Um, this is post-Exodus. So the people have, have come out of the promise. They've come out of captivity in Egypt where they were enslaved for 400 years, and they're on their way to the promised land and they get to the border of the promised land and they send 12 spies. I say this every single time. You know the VBS song. Um, Ten were bad, two were good. Right? The spies come back and they're like, there's no way we can conquer that land. The, the people are too big. The cities are too strong. And 
God basically says, okay, fine, don't. What you can do instead is you can, you can wander the land, you can wander the desert for 40 years, and when all of the people who die who refuse to go into the land, um, that's when you can go back in. So we're like right on the, on the front edge of that. So we've had 400 years of slavery, and then there's 40 years of walking all over the desert. And now, now they begin to enter into the promised land. They begin to do these things. And at the end of the book of Joshua, which is, which is right before Judges, um, the people promise to serve and obey God fully. And what they say in that, in that text at the end of Joshua is like, we're witnesses to ourselves. Like, we're going to be obedient to God, and like, we promise. Well, if you've ever read anything in the Bible, you know that no one's able to do that. The people are going to fail miserably, and it, and it, doesn't, take, um, it doesn't take very long. One of the ways that we often read the book of Judges um, this is sort of like the way we often read the book of Revelation. We read the book of Judges, and we kind of think it's linear, and here's what that means. It's like first you have this judge, and then you have this judge, and then you have this judge, and it kind of starts off, if, if you are reading through the book of Judges that way, it kind of starts off not too bad, and then like when you get to the end of the book, like I said, um, you read it, and it's complete chaos, death, and destruction, and you're like, man, it took a really long time to get there to this point of chaos, death, and destruction reigning. But then there's a really interesting, and just, just stay in Judges 1. If you have the Bible app, all of these verses are in there for you. But just to, just to show that it's not like linear in nature, there's this really interesting verse in, in chapter 20 of Judges. It says, um, this is uh, 27, 2027. The Israelites were seeking direction from the Lord. In those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was in Bethel, and Phinehas, son of Eleazar, and grandson of Aaron, was the priest. So here at the end of the book, what we're learning is, is, the, is the person in charge of the, of the tabernacle at time is the grandson of Aaron, who was brother to Moses. So the end of the book can't be 400 years later. This is not linear. A lot of these judges are overlapping one another, and it's taking place at the same time. And essentially what God tells the people to do as they enter into this promised land is a great theme of the Bible. Um, I think the Bible Project talks about it this way. We know that it's a great theme of the Bible when we read about it in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. Basically, the people are to go into the promised land, and they are to bring order to chaos. They are to, it's called the cultural mandate. Like, that's a really, it's like Christian ease. And here's what the cultural mandate means. It means to fill, subdue, and roll, rule. So the people, when they're going into the promised land, they're to bring order to chaos. The Canaanites are in there, and all of these people groups are in there, and they are just causing chaos. And God is sending his people in there to take control. Really uncomfortable way, it tells them to actually kill everyone, which is a little bit of an ethical concern, I would think. Like, we should have a problem with that. It's okay to read that and be like, oh man, like, I'm bothered by that. Well, how'd they, how'd they do? This is, um, this is Judges 1, uh, starting at verse 21. I'm, I'm not going to read uh, most of the, like, all of these verses. I'm just going to read the beginnings of a lot of them. Verse 21, the tribe of Benjamin, however, failed to drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. Verse 27, the tribe of Manasseh failed to drive out the people of living, people living in Beth Shan. Verse 29, the people of Ephraim failed to drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer. Verse 30, the tribe of Zebulun failed to drive out the residents of Kitron and Nahalal. Verse 31, the tribe of Asher failed to drive out the residents of of Echo, Sidon, Ahlab, etc. Verse 33, likewise, the tribe of Naphtali failed to drive out the residents of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath. Instead, they moved in among the Canaanites who controlled the land. And this is verse 34, chapter 1. As for the tribe of Dan, the Amorites forced them back into the hill country and would not let them come down into the plains. So God gives them this command to take this land and they fail miserably. They don't do it. They don't do what they're called to do. And again, like, we can be bothered by this. I've been listening to this, this amazing podcast over the last year. It's a six-part series. 
Um, there are 20, it's 26 hours, a six-part series over 26 hours by an organization called Hardcore History. And one of the things that this six-hour podcast, it's called, um, oh, just the name of the podcast just slipped my mind. Um, it's about the Asia-Pacific War during World War II and the rise of Japan during World War II. And one of the things that he starts talking about at the end of this podcast, and I've got five minutes left, so I'm going to finish it today. The one I'm listening to now is six hours long. He talks about the ethical concerns at the end of World War II. Right? Should we use the atomic bomb? Should we not use the atomic bomb? So we have ethical concerns. Like we should read this and we should be concerned. Like why would God want the people to kill everyone there? Like that's a good question. We've talked a little bit about this before, but in, in Genesis chapter 20, there's, there's an answer. Actually, it's Genesis 15, 16. There's an answer. God predicts that his people are going to go into the promised land eventually. Listen to this crazy prediction. You can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. This is before that happened. So God's predicting this. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them. That's Egypt. And in the end, they will come away with great wealth. If you're familiar with your Bible, you know that when the, when the Israelites left Egypt, what did they have with them? They had all the gold, all the silver, all the plunder. Listen to verse 16. After four generations, your descendants will return here to this land, for the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction. We talked about the Amorites a second ago. Did you catch verse 34 in Judges 1? As for the tribe of Dan, the Amorites forced them back into the hill country. See, these are the same people. I want to encourage you this week, please read what we're going to talk about next week. This will help you follow along. See, see, what does that mean that the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction? These were bad people. Like, sacrificing babies in fire, bad people. That was how they worshipped the god Moloch. So, when the Israelites come rolling out of Egypt, God's like, you know what? Those Amorites, they had 400 years to stop throwing babies in fires. They had 400 years. My patience is done. Do work, Israelites. Judge this nation. And that's still a little uncomfortable for us. I get that. But there's context for this. See, God, is, God doesn't like people sacrificing babies in fires. And as we're going to talk about throughout this series, one of the things that we're going to talk about throughout this series is that there's, there's a penalty for sin. There's a penalty for disobedience. And that's a challenge for us in our day because we, we don't like penalties for disobedience. That's not our view, and it's not often our understanding, and it certainly isn't the world's understanding of who God is. We don't like penalties for disobedience. So the people fail. They don't do what God tells them to. So what is God going to do about it, right? What happens next? This is uh, Judges um, 2, 1 to 5. You can follow along with me. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Boykim and said to the Israelites, I brought you out of Egypt into this land that I swore to give to your ancestors, and I said I would never break my covenant with you. For your part, you were not to make any covenants with the people living in this land. Instead, you were to destroy their altars. But you disobeyed my command. Why did you do this? So now I will declare that I will no longer drive out the people living in your land. They will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be constant temptations to you. See, there are consequences to sin. Verse 4, when the angel of the Lord finished speaking to all the Israelites, the people leapt wildly, leapt, wept loudly. So they called the place Boykim, which means weeping, and they offered sacrifices there to the Lord. See, as we read through the next 19 chapters of the book, one of the things that we're going to see is, is weeping plus sacrifice does not equal obedience. 
as you follow through the rest of this text, what you're going to see is people who cry about their sin and make sacrifices, they're not necessarily going to be obedient people. See, there's a difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. That's something that's talked about in the New Testament. And if you're wondering what the difference is, if you're a parent in the room, think about what happens when you catch your children doing something they know they're not supposed to do. That's worldly sorrow. Sorrow. Essentially, I'm sorry I got caught, is what worldly sorrow is. And that's where the people are here. And that's a little harsh judgment, so why would I say that? Well, read the rest of the book. And what you'll see is they perpetually sin, and perpetually sin, and perpetually sin. So if weeping plus sacrifice doesn't equal obedience... Weeping plus sacrifice minus obedience does not equal holiness. See, what God God wants for his people, what God wants for his people is for them to be holy. He doesn't just want them to do all of the right things. He wants them to be holy. He wants them to be new people. He He wants them to be changed from the inside out. We read over the next few verses that Joshua dies. And then verse 10. After that generation died, so the people go into the promised land. They don't do what they're supposed to do. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. And as we continue to read here in a second, um, we, have to, we have to recognize that, that the sin that, the, that these people are going to commit, um, as bad as it, like it is worshiping these false gods, it is uh, being part, being, building partnerships with all of the people, it, like those things are their sins, but those things are really the fruit of their sin. The root of their sin is they did not pass the faith on to the next generation. That's the root of their sin. That's why it's so bad. Is they did not take seriously the role to pass along the faith to the next generation. They knew what they were supposed to do. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Remember, write it on your heads, tie it on your hands. When you wake up, when you go to bed, when you're walking, tell your kids, tell, like, pass along the faith to the generations, share that. Like, they didn't do any of that. And it brings them to this place where we find right now, like, now there's a consequence. You reap what you sow. Like, that's not karma, but we reap what we sow. When we fail to live out the plans that God has for us, there's going to be a consequence for that. We are collectively, they, as collectively as a culture and a society, they're going to pay. Citizens of the United States, Christian citizens of the United States, how are we doing? Have we passed on the faith? Have we shared the gospel with our children? Now, they're going to make their own choices. They're going to make their own decision. They're going to come to their own conclusions. But each and every one of us, parent or grandparent, single, married, not married, aunts and uncles, friends of families, we have the responsibility to make disciples of the next generation. Every single one of us. It's not optional. And if we don't, we get the culture that we have. And we have to ask some hard, like it's, it's time for us to ask some hard questions about what happens. And Sue talked about the, the grandparenting summit that's coming up in October. Grandparents, this is such an opportunity for you. It's $59 for two days of awesome equipping. If you go at the end of those two days, if it's not worth $59 to you, we'll rep- I'll refund your money. Seriously. It's $59. We're, 
One of the things that I've found as, as I've done parent equipping things since I was in student ministry and, and we've done them here, grandparent equipping things, every single time at the end of those, at least one parent or grandparent comes up to me and says, I wish they would have had something like this 20 years ago. Every single time, without fail, parents and grandparents alike say the exact same thing. Here it is. This is the opportunity. Because we want to equip you. We want to teach you. We don't, we don't want this to be the future, not just, not just for our country, not just for our community. We don't want this to be the future for, our, for your family. We're just, we're just asking you to participate in the equipping that God is going to do. We're confident in what God is going to do. I love that we have this opportunity to host this. Will you sign up? And seriously, if you come up to me at the, in, at the end of the day on Friday and you're like, oh, this was the worst thing I've ever, I've ever been a part of, we're going to refund your money. Like, I don't think that's going to happen. Because I know that when we place ourselves humbly before what God is telling us, and we evaluate where we're really at, God changes us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I just want to invite you into that. So that's the root of their sin. They fail to pass on their faith. Like, that's it. That's why. So what's the fruit? What's the fruit, right? We know the root. We live in an agricultural area. That's the part that's under the ground. One of the things that I've found over the last year plus of living where we live is like our, we have a fence in our backyard and then there's like an alley and there's like five feet between the fence and the alley and there's this ground that's back there where all the weeds grow up and one of the things that's really easy to do is fire up your lawnmower and walk over all of those weeds and then look there's no weeds <laughs> wrong see all I do when I do that is I cut the fruit of those weeds. So what I have to actually do is go out there and pull it up. I have to deal with the, with the root of the weed. So the root of the weed is they, or the root of their sin is they didn't pass on the face. So what were, what were the results? Because a lot of times we think there are no consequences to our sin. Verse 11, chapter 2, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and they served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people around them, and they angered the Lord. They abandoned the Lord to serve Baal and the images of Ashtoreth. Like, those are bad things. They shouldn't do those things. But here's the reality. If they just stop doing those things, then they don't fix their failure to pass on the faith. There's just going to be a new crop of sins that comes up. Have you experienced that in your life? Like you finally get like one sin under control. Like you, you've been living with one sin or two sins for your entire life and you tell yourself, oh, if I could just, if I could just stop doing this, if I, could, if I could start doing that, if I could fix this problem and you don't deal with your heart issue, like you fix the problem and then what happens? Boop. Another weed just comes right out of that root. So this is, this is the fruit, and, and the question that we have to ask is like, so what is God going to do? Isn't that sometimes our question? Like if we want to be real honest about where we are in our, in our mindset and our connectivity with God, like when we're choosing to sin, kind of us, aren't some of us like, well, what's God going to do? Like really, what's God going to do? Have you ever asked that? Maybe not out loud, because we would never do that. But mentally, have you ever asked that question? Like, What's so bad about this? Well, here's verse 14. This made the Lord burn with anger against Israel, so he handed them over to raiders who stole their possessions. He turned them over to the enemies all around, and they were lo no longer able to resist them. Every time Israel went out to battle, the Lord fought against them causing them to be defeated just as he had warned, and the people were in great distress. See, here's the thing. Like, God told them what was going to happen. If we were to go back to that text in, in Genesis, and we were to kind of read through um, Genesis through uh, where we are today in Judges, 
We're going to see time and time again that God is calling his people to him. He's calling them to obedience. He's calling them to love. He's calling them to follow him. And, and every single time he's like, and if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And as I think about how God interacts with us when we, when we sin in this way, oftentimes I think it's, 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 it's less about judgment and more about consequences. Like, if the speed limit's 35 and I go 60 and I get pulled over, like, that's not the state judging me. It's a consequence. Does that make sense? Like, if I know the speed limit's 35 and I go 60 and I get pulled over, I can't do what we all do and think that's bogus. Like, we have to accept the consequences, and these are consequences of God. And I wonder what it would be like if, if Judges just ended right there. Like, that would, like, this would be the shortest sermon series we've ever done. But I wonder, like, aren't you glad that that's not where it ends? So what happens next? This is verses 16 to 23. So he judges them. There's consequences for their sin. He's angry with them. He's not going to kick the people out. He's not going to do this. Verse 16, Then the Lord raised up judges to rescue the Israelites from their attackers. Yet Israel, see, here you go. Yet Israel did not listen to the judges, but prostituted themselves by worshiping other gods. That's a nice church word, prostituted. How quickly they turned away from the path of their ancestors who had walked in obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge over Israel, he was with that judge and rescued the people from their enemies throughout the judge's lifetime. For the Lord took pity on his people who were burdened by oppression and suffering. But when the judge died, the people returned to their corrupt ways, leaving, behaving worse than those who had lived before them. So here's all the judges did. They mowed over the weeds. They went after other gods, serving and worshiping them, and they refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. So the Lord burned with anger against Israel. He said, because these people have violated my covenant, which I made with their ancestors and have ignored their commands, I will no longer drive out the nations that Joshua left unconquered when he died. I did this to test Israel to see whether they would follow, whether or not they would follow the ways of the Lord as their ancestors did. This is why the Lord left those nations in place. He did not quickly drive them out or allow Joshua to conquer them all. See, it was their sin. And what we find in this text, like here, that's a template for the next 19 chapters of the book. So here, that's the summary of what we're going to read about over the next 19 pages. Basically, the Israelites do evil. God allows the consequences of their sin to take place. They're going to be conquered. They're going to be oppressed. They're going to cry out to God. God's going to send a judge, or a judge just shows up to save them. See, as we read this, it's, it's easy for us to ask this question like, why are why are the people so stupid? Have you ever, like when you've read through this, like why did, why do they keep doing this? Why don't they see this cycle and then because we're better than them, we answer the question with, I mean, because I would never do that. Right? Why are they so bad? Why do they constantly make all these bad decisions? Because that's not, that's not me. And I think Joe, a couple weeks ago, when he read through Luke chapter 15, and we, we read the story of, um, of the prodigal son, like when we do that, we're the older brother in that story. We're judging everyone else for their sin and refusing to see the sin of ourselves. Why do they do this? Maybe another question is, why does God keep handling the Israelites this way? Like, when I read through this story, I'm like, man, he is, God, that's, I mean, all they did was worship other gods. All they did was 
was, was build a, an asterisk pole and worship it. Like, what's, what's the big deal? What's the big deal about this sin? Like, why does it matter? Well, sin has consequences. Parents, when you tell your children not to do something and they do it, do, doesn't th isn't there a consequence? I mean, if you're a good parent, there's a consequence. See, God, God is calling his people to, to, to be something, and, and it's not just about where they go to worship, but it's about who they are. And what God is continually doing, like when we read this, um, he's, he's, trying to, he's trying to help them know who they are. And that, um, there's going to be a lot of blood in that. There's going to be a lot of blood because de delivering people from themselves is not clean and tidy. Like if you, could just, if you could just get over your sin, then why haven't you done it? Why haven't you fixed yourself? Because it's hard, right? That's tough work. If you don't think it is, come behind my house and pull the, pull the roots out in my backyard. Like, it's hard work. Some of them things are in there. Some of our sins, like, they're in here. And, and if I could just pull that out, like, that would be wonderful, but we, but we can't. So here's, I think those are great questions. Why are the people so dumb? Why does God judge them in this way? But I, I think there's actually a better question. And that better question is, why does God continually deliver his people? Who among us, who among us, would have the heart that God has for his people. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Why does God deliver his people? Why does he keep doing this? Read Psalm 108, 103 this week. Verses um, 8 through 18. And I think this starts to answer the question. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us, even as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as east is from the West. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. See, why doesn't, why does God keep doing that? Because he loves us. Because he, lo he, lo he loves you. He doesn't just love us. Like that's a really great thing to talk about in church, about how like we say God loves us. Like we're this, this nebulous group of people, this mass. And then we say things like, God loves you. And we hear that also in general terms. Like, of course, like he loves everybody. But God actually loves you. Like, you. God loves you. And I think the reason that, that judges is, is a bloody mess is because in the midst of the blood and despite it and through it, God is pursuing every single one of us. God is pursuing us. He's bent on our salvation. And he wants to deliver us from our sin and our guilt and our shame. He is pursuing you. He is chasing you. He sent his son, Jesus, to die for you. And if we think that's without blood, we don't know the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for you. 
that was not clean. That was not a tidy death. That was not without consequence. It was a violent death for our sins. See, like the rest of the Bible, we talk about this in this way. Like the Bible's not written to us. We know that when we read the letter to the Ephesians, as a for instance, it says to the church at Ephesus, we are not the church at Ephesus. But the Bible is for us. And in that book, in Ephesians, in chapter 2, again, if you have, if you're following along on version, those are all in there. Like this is going to reflect back on us reality. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But in our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. That sounds exactly what we just read in Judges, doesn't it? The people do whatever they want to. They don't take the land. They don't pass the faith along to the next generation. And, and the weeds start to grow. And God, God brings the hurt on them. He brings some pain. He's like, if you don't want to obey me, there are going to be consequences to that. The nations that you refuse to destroy, they are gonna, they're going to be thorns in your side. Every single one of us living in western Nebraska, you've stepped on one of those goat heads, haven't you? It's such a small, have you, it's such a small thing. It's kind of like stepping on a Lego. Like, it's, it's such a small thing, a goat head, until you step on one. See, these, these people are going, to, are going to bother and bother, and they're going to tempt, and they're going to tease his people away from God. And we are them. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. We bear the consequences of our sin. How many times have you sinned, and then something bad happens, and you're like, why did that bad thing happen? Well, it's easy, because you're a sinner, and... There are consequences to our sin. And I just love, I love verse 4. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he's done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. So we ask that question, why does God keep saving his people? Why does he do this? It's because he's graceful. Because he shows grace. It demonstrates an example. It's an example of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. And sometimes I wonder if we see that. If we see God's mercy as an example of grace and kindness, or do we just take advantage of it? Do we just do what we want to anyway? God saved you by his grace. This is verse 8. When you believed, and you can't take credit for this, it's a gift from God. Verse 9 is so awesome. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. See, simply, simply being a good moral person, like, it's not enough. We need something else. We need to be delivered from our sin. We need, we need the root of sin in our lives. We need that pulled out. We need that gone. And if we refuse to do that, we're just, we're just mo you're just mowing over weeds. And that's why so many of us feel trapped in our sin. It's why we wallow in guilt and shame, because we've not dealt with the root. Or 
to be more specific, we've not allowed Jesus to deal with the root. We've thought that we could do that ourselves. And I have some really bad news for you. You can't. And I have some really good news for you. There's a rescuer named Jesus who is not a jack wagon. He is perfect, he is holy, he is righteous, and he has sacrificed himself for you so that you can have hope. And that's what we're going to be talking about as we go through the book of Judges together. Let's pray. God, I'm just wanting to ask you to be with us as we read through this book. Um, I pray that we would not just we would not just have a better understanding. We would not just settle for a better understanding of what's happening in the book of Judges. That we would, we would not only, um, we would not settle for simply exegeting it correctly and, and being faithful and true, and that's important. But we don't want to settle for that. We want life change. God, I, like, I need you to uproot sin in my life. Every person in this room needs you to uproot the sin that's in their life. And I pray that as we spend time in your word over these next eight or ten weeks, that we would allow you to uproot the sin that's in our lives. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
given me more than I could ever have wanted and I want to give you my heart and my Good morning. My name is Jim Miller. I'm one of the elders here at Westway Christian Church. And uh, just a quick reminder, we take communion every week to remember Jesus' sacrifice, but more importantly, his love for you and I. This morning, I would like to read passage from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 through 21. Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one point, we thought Christ merely from a human point of view how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, the new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave, this, gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. He spoke, or we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering of our sin so that we could be made right through God, with God through Christ. So you see this, this person that we're remembering today isn't just a historical figure because without Jesus' sacrifice, we could not be in God's grace. So we'll take communion. Um, again, the the... The summary of, of 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, Lord took, Jesus took some bread. He gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread. In the same way, he took a cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. So let's take the cup. So today I'd like us to take just a few moments to reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made for each of us. Let me pray. Lord, thank you that we experience your amazing grace, love, and faithfulness in and through Jesus Christ. Amen. 
for offering. Um, this month we'll be talking about 2 Corinthians 9, 7. And it says, you must decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Uh, for Linda and I, we are kind of boring in this. We, we sit down and we decide what we want to give for the year. And then we break that up into 12 or 52 payments. And we give that each month. And that's how we have decided to give. And it has worked for us for 40 years, 40 plus years. But that's how we do it. And feel important that we should give every week. That is just our thing. And that's what we deem that we wanted to do in our marriage. So the key here is we want to give so that we can further the God's kingdom. Let me pray. Well, <clears throat> so let me pray. First of all, Lord, we want to thank you for the generosity of the people that are sitting in this room or that are out um, watching us on, on video. We want to thank you that we have this opportunity. We want to thank you for the people that give their money, their time, their efforts, their energy to make Westway a place that we can help further your kingdom here in Scotts Bluff, throughout Nebraska, and throughout the world. So we praise you. And we thank you that we get to experience this amazing grace and love and faithfulness from Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ. So we praise you. And we give you all the glory, Lord. In your son's name, amen. Let's sing this one more time as we pray to leave this place. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways, you're the only one who can, you're the only one who can, you're the only one who can. I want to thank you again for joining us this week. God bless you as you leave this place, and we'll see you next week.